Welcome to the Café Culture podcast, a season of discussions on culture, politics, philosophy and science. This event was recorded on the 15th of April 2013, when Jackie Leach Scully discussed cochlear implants, scientific and ethical considerations. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Can I just say that the induction loop is very quiet to me, so uh, it might need jacking up a little bit. Is anybody actually using the induction loop? Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. We are a small, um, hopefully um, select, elite I think the phrase should be audience. Um, if any of you want to come any nearer during the discussion, that's, um, that's fine. Um, and I don't think I'm going to be talking for anything like 40 minutes. Um, and we'll see how the discussion goes afterwards. Um, my background is uh, as a scientist and uh, then moving from science into bioethics over uh, a period of some years and now. I work at the Policy, Ethics and Life Science Insti uh, Research Centre here at Newcastle University. Um, all through that period, I'd also consider myself to be um, a disability activist in some way. I worked uh, in Switzerland for many years and was very involved uh, in the disability movement uh, in, in Switzerland and to a lesser extent since I've been uh, back in, in this country. And one of the interesting questions maybe to think about in general uh, through the talk is about how we think about disability and human variation, particularly in the context of deafness. I should perhaps say, if, if, does anybody need any sign interpretation of anything? I think we have somebody who can do something along those lines. Um, and this um, talk and the discussion uh, will be a podcast and there'll be a transcript available for people who, like me, who actually prefer to have a, a transcript. Um, the title of the talk is The Scientific and Ethical Considerations of Cochlear Implants. I'm not a specialist in the technology of cochlear implants, so if any of you are here to find out whether you are a good candidate for cochlear implantation or something like that, I'm not the person to ask. I know the basics uh, of how these work. I'm more interested in the uh, social and ethical implications of cochlear implants and in particular um, some of the specifics um, that are to do with that particular technology and its relationship to the deaf community. Um, as well as the more standard ethical implications that are, to, in a sense, um, common to many kinds of biomedical uh, piece of kit. Because of the topic, because we're talking about disability, we're talking about deafness, we're talking about deafness with a capital D, deaf community, and deafness with a lowercase d, I need to say, as many of you are aware, that the, the language in talking about those topics is a bit of a minefield. There are political sensitivities about whether one refers to hearing impaired or capital D deaf or lowercase deaf and all that kind of thing. Um, people have different opinions on this. Um, I try to be consistent, but I'm not always. I think my own political persuasions will come through in the course of the talk. If you disagree with me vehemently, um, say something in the question and answer session rather than get excited uh, during the talk. Okay, are we all familiar with what a cochlear implant is? Does anybody need to be told any more about what a cochlear implant is? A little bit. Um, it, People tend to think of them as being like high-tech hearing aids, but they're not really, and, and I, I'll come on later on to why, that's, uh, why that is the case. They're small electronic devices which are designed to provide a sense of sound to people with severe or profound uh, deafness and who aren't helped by conventional hearing aids. And I'm saying that very carefully. They provide a sense of sound. What they do is um, there's a microphone which is external to the body which picks up sounds and a processor and a transmitter that turns those sounds uh, into electronic impulses. 
And then within the skull, usually in the temporal bone just behind the ear, there's a, a receiver and then electrodes that go um, into the cochlea or near the auditory nerve that turn... The, so the sound is turned into electrical impulses, which is then turned into signals to the nerve, which then goes to the brain, which the brain understands as sound. So the first thing to grasp is that what people with a cochlear implant hear uh, is not sound, and it's not an amplified version of sound in the way that a conventional hearing aid is. It's an electronic version of sound, which is quite different. Cochlear implants were first developed in the 1960s and 70s, but they first became properly commercially available in the 1980s. Um, t to date, something like 250,000 people worldwide have been implanted, which always sounds a little bit odd to me, as if it's the people that you're implanting rather than having received an implant, but have been implanted. Um, and so that number is growing um, consistently. About half of those are children and half are adults, and that's quite an important ethical point, which I'll come back to later on. The latest figures that I have for the UK is that there are about 11,000 people uh, using a cochlear implant with CI in this country, and each year there are about 500 adults and 500 children um, implanted. Now, according to the, the NICI guidelines, which is the body that gives guidelines to what the NHS should be providing, there's no um, free line whip on that, it's what the it's guidance for what should be provided. Cochlear implant in one ear is recommended as an option for anyone with severe to profound deafness if they don't get enough benefit from conventional powerful hearing aids after trying them for a minimum of three months. Bilateral cochlear implants, that is one in each ear, um, seem to provide improved uh, results, improved outcomes, so again that's something I'll come back to later on. And the NICE guidelines however say that um, they're recommended, bilateral cochlear implants are recommended for children and for adults who have some kind of visual impairment or other impairment that makes it harder for them to, um, that makes them more reliant on sound, particularly for directionality of sound. It does seem as if people do benefit more from having by everybody who benefits at all, benefits more from having bilateral cochlear implants. However, the cost-benefit analysis that NICE and the NHS do is that the additional benefit of a second um, implant is not enough for the majority uh, of, of adults. What can happen then is that an adult will get one cochlear implant on the NHS and if they want another one in the other ear, um, pay for it themselves in this country. We'll come back to costs later on. Overall, the evidence suggests that people do benefit from CIs, but the variation in the amount of benefit is enormous. Adults and children who have already acquired speech and language, and then they become deaf later on, tend to do very well with CIs. And that's because the, the auditory pathways in the ear and the brain have uh, developed. They understand, the brain understands, the mind understands, the person understands what sound is and how to, how to deal with it um, cognitively. And so even if hearing has been lost, those pathways can be stimulated again with a cochlear implant. Although it takes quite a long time for the brain to learn how to interpret these rather weird impulses that are coming in uh, as being sound at all. Children who are born deaf or deafened before they acquire speech and language can also do very well. And the current professional consensus is that the earlier those children are implanted with a CI, the better. And the, the age has been coming down consistently. And at the moment, the feeling is that the best age to, for a child who has been born deaf or uh, lost their hearing early to be implanted is somewhere between one and two and a half years of age. That obviously raises some significant ethical problems um, as well. 
After about the age of five, the, the outcomes as it were, of having an implant um, decline and get gradually less good. Um, the literature tends to say, or the quote that I've got here is, implanting a congenitally deaf teenager tends to produce less good results. And then when I read that, I thought that doing anything to a teenager tends to give less good results anyway because they're teenagers. Um, implanting an adult uh, who has never heard speech and that doesn't understand what sound is uh, supposed to, be, to mean also has less good results. However, less good doesn't mean catastrophic or not worth it. It just means it's not quite as good. But people are highly variable. Some people who it would be predicted not to do very well with cochlear implants do extremely well. Others that appear to buy you know, on paper um, to be good candidates end up disappointed and um, not quite as, uh, as good a result as you would hope. Uh, given that providing hearing to people who have lost their hearing or do not have their hearing would seem on the face of it to be an unquestionably good thing to do, it might be um, a bit surprising that there are actually ethical considerations in that. And those are what I want to focus on this evening. People entering at a natural break. It's always good. As I said, with cochlear implants, there are what you might call standard ethical issues, and there are some um, rather unique ones. The standard ones are the ones that, are to, to do, that you encounter with any kind of sophisticated biomedical technology. Primarily, that's to do with safety. There's somebody signing there. Do you... I, One of the primary ones is to do with safety, that any kind of invasive surgery carries risks, um, risks of um, problems with the anaesthesia, uh, with infection after the operation, and with CIs there's also risk of the surgery um, causing damage to the nerves in the face. And the problem of those sorts of risks needs to be borne in mind, particularly when parents are making a decision about surgery on young children, because after all, this isn't life-saving surgery on a one to two and a half year old child. It's something that you're choosing to do in the hope of uh, having a better outcome for that child. There are safety issues to do with having an implant in the bone that stays there for a long time, years uh, or for a uh, whole life. And thinking through what you'll do if the device fails, if the cochlear implant fails, has to be removed, or you get developments of technology that suggest that it would be a good idea to kind of upgrade the CI that's there. So consent here is, an, is a central, uh, central question. Insertion of an implant, of a cochlear implant, is potentially irreversible. One of the reasons is that the surgical process tends to damage the residual hearing that's there. So once you have opted to have a cochlear implant, it's usually not possible to go back and decide to have a conventional hearing aid instead because the he residual hearing is no longer there. And that's why one reason why some people say that cochlear implantation should be left until somebody is about 16 so that they can consent um, legally as well as everything else to having something like that potentially irreversible happening to them. But as I already mentioned, the optimal age for implantation is much earlier than 60. So if you wait to somebody 60, you might well have waited too long for the benefit to be worth it anyway. Another ethical issue is about the efficacy of cochlear implants. Do they do what they're supposed to do? There's a lot of um, media talk about cochlear implants as kind of bionic ears. Now, cochlear implants are not magic by bionic ears that provide uh, normal hearing again. They provide an electronic sense of sound to people who aren't helped by conventional aids. So things like having uh, an operation and then having a long-term <laughs> implant and then having the aftercare 
and the rehabilitation that you need. Because when you have a cochlear implant put in and then switched on, you don't immediately start hearing. You have to learn how to hear with that uh, piece of machinery. And that can take months and sometimes, um, sometimes years. So these um, experiences are not trivial and they're not cheap either. So the outcome has to be worth it. The cochlear implant must be successful. And the central question here is, how do you measure the success of a cochlear implant? That might sound like a very easy question uh, to answer, but do you measure the changes in somebody's response to a pure tone uh, audiometry in a lab with headphones? Do you measure how somebody's speech comprehension, either with or without lip reading, has improved? Do you measure educational attainment, what qual qualifications they come out of school with? Do you measure what kind of employment they end up with? Do you measure how socially integrated they are? And how would you measure that, actually? Um, do you measure how happy they are in their lives? And how would you measure that? So it's not surprising that what people do is look for the things that are easy to measure like changes in hearing um, on an audiogram or changes in speech comprehension. But you have to remember that they may not be directly linked to somebody's educational att attainment or to their happiness in life. And there's, in fact, quite a lot of evidence to suggest that um, cochlear implants benefit things like speech comprehension enormously, but they don't necessarily benefit social integration or educational achievement uh, quite as much. Another thing we want to think about is, is related to, to that is about expectations um, and how they are uh, managed. Something to do with the ethics of accurate advertising and the avoidance of hype. And both the media and the providers of cochlear implants have been in the past equally at fault here, because terminology like bionic ears tends to, assume, tends to imply that there's some kind of cure um, for deafness, and much of the media reporting, the newspaper reports that you see about cochlear implants, they kind of focus on individual human interest stories, and they're always successful. They're always about a small child receiving a bionic implant and suddenly becoming you know, whole and happy again. And that tends to lead to unrealistic expectations among adults who may fork out some money for an implant and then be disappointed with the results or disappointed in the fact that they have to make an effort to learn how to use it. But even more worryingly, it's a situation of uh, parents, hearing parents, of children who are diagnosed with deafness, who, for whom this is unexpected, they may be devastated by the news that their child is deaf and they're very vulnerable to being told by somebody that a cochlear implant will give them a normal child back again. And because there is so much hype around cochlear implants, there's been a tendency among parents in that situation to jump over the, the stage of trying out hearing aids with their child and go straight to the idea, oh, if we get a cochlear implant, it's going to um, cure everything, make everything better, give me a normal child back again. And finally, I want to make a, a point here about money, a general point uh, about money and profit and commerce. This is the concern that the, the measurement of outcomes and success and the reporting of the kind that I've talked about may not be unbiased. In any situation in which there's a significant profit to be made, then the ethical waters get a little bit murky. And these are expensive bits of kit. One cochlear implant, implant costs something like £18,000 as a piece of technology. The total cost of assessment and the surgery and the aftercare and post-operative care for a year and training is around £40,000. That's what it costs the NHS. There are only a very small number of companies involved in manufacturing cochlear implants. They have something of a monopoly. 
and there's a lot of money to be made. So potentially there's a problem if some of the evaluation of the success of cochlear implants relies on information that's provided uh, by companies that produce cochlear implants uh, or by clinicians who have strong links to companies that produce uh, cochlear implants. If you're making some kind of a judgment about whether to have a CI, whether to have two CIs uh, but, uh, bilaterally, you want to have complete confidence that the benefit that you're told will happen is objectively the case and you're not being told that two are better than one simply because that means the company can flog you two uh, rather than one CI. So, safety and efficacy and profit and consent are actually issues that are common to many other technologies. So I want to turn now to what is really the unique uh, ethical problem, which is the relationship between cochlear implants and the signing deaf community. For ease of reference here, I'm going to call it just the deaf community. So I think we all appreciate that when people talk about the community of any kind, it's, it's evening out a lot of um, internal difference. In the early days of CIs being available, and particularly as young children began to be implanted and the age got younger and younger, the response of the deaf community, the signing deaf community, to CIs was overall extremely negative. To those in the deaf world for whom deafness is not a disability, certainly not a serious disability, but instead something more like a cultural <laughs> minority group with a distinctive language form. To those people, then taking deaf children who would learn sign as their first language and who would then grow up with deaf culture as their background in the deaf world, taking those children and implanting them with CIs so that they became hearing children instead was seen as presenting a really strong threat to the continuing existence of the deaf world. Not so much that there would no longer be deaf children or deaf people, because there always will be, people will always get illnesses and lose their hearing, but that there wouldn't be people, children, growing up within the culture of the deaf world who could then carry that culture on to successive generations. And to understand the strength of this feeling at that time, it's important to put it in the context that from the 1980s and 1990s, which was exactly when CIs were becoming a commonplace, was the beginning of a rise of a political consciousness among deaf people, certainly in this country and the US, uh, and the sense of the power of having a political identity. And during that time also, there was a growing awareness of the history of deaf people uh, in Europe and North America in the early to mid 20th century, um, in which attempts to eradicate deaf people and uh, the deaf world and deaf culture were, uh, you know, they were a reality, a eugenic reality. They weren't paranoia. So it's against that background that there's this strong resistance. And for a while, in the 80s and 90s, the opposition by the deaf community was really fierce. And I can remember um, terms like genocide being banded around about the attempt to eradicate the deaf community. Um, those deaf people who chose to use cochlear implants could be regarded as traitors uh, by others uh, in the community, uh, or even within their own families. And there's a very well-known documentary, uh, American documentary called Sound and Fury, which is about uh, a deaf family in the US with two brothers. Uh, one chooses to have his child, it's a hereditary form of deafness, one chooses to have his child um, have a cochlear implant and the other does not. And it's a documentary of how that family is actually split apart by the controversy there. Now, I want to emphasise that that wasn't the whole story. There was a range of opinion about cochlear implants within the deaf community. But the strength of that strongest view that was there could make it very difficult at that time uh, for members of the deaf community who wanted to use uh, implants. Uh, it's quite interesting that attitudes within the deaf community have softened 
about cochlear implants a lot in the last few years. And paradoxically, that's actually been in line with a growing realisation about what the reality of cochlear implants uh, are. Remember that the deaf community's fear was that implantation would turn deaf children into hearing ones and they would be lost to the deaf world. We now know, they've had enough time and enough experience, that deaf children with cochlear implants don't become hearing children. Cochlear implants just aren't that good. They remain children with non-standard hearing, with a significant degree of, hearing, degree of hearing impairment, if you use that language, to a greater or lesser extent, they often choose to continue to use sign language either at home or among their friends, um, and they may well continue to need extra educational support if, if they're in mainstream schools. They're not deaf children in the way that they used to be deaf children either, because they have had access to sound and to areas of social life they might not otherwise have done. And some recent uh, research, which is the kind of uh, the area of research that I'm interested in, that, that looks at some adolescents who've used um, CIs and showing them shifting from having either a strong hearing identity or a deaf identity, and in their use of CIs, becoming people who think of themselves as being a kind of hybrid or binary identity, either a bit of both, both hearing uh, and deaf, or one or of the other in different times that context or context, perhaps um, a deaf child at home or deaf identity at home, a hearing identity uh, on the street, um, depending on, on where they feel most comfortable. So I want to end by saying that the, the cochlear implant controversy um, is both a very, very small and local one but it's also have much wider implications. It flags up two interesting things. The first is the real complexity of what happens when a new biomedical technology that may appear to be relatively unproblematic and unproblematically good to the person who developed it there gets out into the real world and it starts being used by groups and communities for whom it has a very different meaning and a very different impact and a diversity of unexpected personal and social meanings. And that lesson can be generalised to other biomedical technology. But secondly, it also highlights the ambiguous place of hearing impairment uh, or deafness within the spectrum of human variation and disability. Now, hearing loss, if somebody has standard hearing and loses some or all of it, whether that's gradual as comes on with most of us as we get older, uh, or whether it's a consequence of illness or accident. Hearing loss is almost always traumatic and it's experienced as a loss. But hearing impairment, which is present from birth or early childhood, may not be experienced as a loss, but as a person's or community's norm, that may be what is normal for them. And so dividing the world into people with normal hearing and people with hearing that can be made normal with the help of something like an implant um, is both damaging and oversimplistic. And I think the cochlear implant story and the ethics of cochlear implantation is actually really useful in making us think very much more carefully about some of those um, subtleties and nuances of how we think about deafness and disability and normality. Thank you. Cafe Culture North East is supported by Newcastle University, Peels and the British Science Association. We're also supported by Ginger's Cafe in Dun City, who host the events. <laughs>